Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Oh, yeah, we can have the lights on a little bit more. Um, and hello, everybody, up on the balcony as well. This feels like a proper theatre setup, cabaret style, with your tables. Um, I'm Maria Montague. I'm the deputy director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, and we are an independent charity dedicated to broadening knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. And we do this through talks with experts like our event this evening, uh, but also through our Ukrainian language school, through educational courses and through cultural events. Uh, for example, we have a Ukrainian film festival that's going to be coming up at the end of uh, November, beginning of December, which we're excited to announce. Um, and we are fully funded by donations and ticket sales, um, as well as project grants. Um, so we're really grateful to all of you for booking your tickets for this evening's event, which also helps us to hold at least some of our events free of charge um, as often as we can. Um, and this evening we are holding our event in partnership with the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain. And we're really happy to have Vlodko, the head of AUGB London, with us tonight. And um, we're also really, really grateful to Denise Restaurant for hosting us here in this absolutely gorgeous venue. Yeah, let's go around the room. Thank you so much, Lana and Serge, for everything that you've done to help us prepare for this evening. And um, we hope that we might continue working together in the future because it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you to all of you for making the trip if it was um, far for you. But I can guarantee that the Vraniki and Borsche are going to be worth it. I've tried them myself. and. Um, it's all absolutely delicious. Anyway, let's get started with our event um, this evening. So we're going to be taking stock of the 30 years of Ukraine's independence. And um, we've got a fantastic panel, Orisin Savic, uh, the head of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House, and Yaroslava Barbieri and Peter Pomerantsev, both from the ARENA program. Um, and this evening is a particularly special event for me because um, alongside my work with the Institute, I also have been working with ARENA for the past couple of years and I had the chance to work on the report that we are going to be speaking about uh, this evening as well. Um, and it was a fascinating project. We held um, 20 focus groups across the whole of Ukraine, um, which was just brilliant to get to hear from real people about what they think about the last 30 years and which events which shared experiences stand out to them um, and it was amazing to see how much commonality there was in the answers that people gave and um, one small example of that is uh, asking them for example about popular culture and as a non-Ukrainian myself I found myself starting to feel nostalgic about Maski Show and Dobronosuki which I've never seen <laughs> Um, but people had so much warm emotion talking about these TV shows that I started to feel like warm and fuzzy hearing about them. Um, and there were other shared experiences like Euro 2012 that really, really stood out that, um, that Ukrainians across the country um, really felt a strong sense of pride, uh, especially in terms of the international recognition that Ukraine gained thanks to the UEFA Championships. Um, and this was east to west, including the occupied territories uh, in Donbass. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hold focus groups in Crimea, but we were really pleased that, uh, to hear um, thoughts from, from those in the occupied territories in Donbass. And I'm sure we're going to come back to um, speaking about these territories and what the future might look like um, for a reintegrated Ukraine today. Um, and we'll move on to that later. Um, so I will... We'll start today. I'm really looking forward to introducing Arisia into the discussion to have to think a bit more about the broader context. Um, but before we do that, we'll hear from Peter and Yara, who are going to give a quick summary of, of the arena research. And we'll start with Peter, so I'll just do a quick introduction for Peter, who will be known to lots of you here today. Um, Peter is an author and journalist. Um, and many of you will know his books, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, about Russian propaganda, and his latest book, This is Not Propaganda. <laughs> and um, Peter is the director of the ARENA program that was formerly based at London School of Economics and is now at Johns Hopkins University in the States. Um, so Peter, we'll hand over to you now to um, start with the summary of our research. Hi, um, and uh, I wish I could be with you. I was actually at Veselka in New York on, on Sunday, 
uh, gorging myself on their vareniki. Um, and uh, if you go there, I really recommend the, uh, they have goat's cheese and arugula vareniki. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, but I'm sure I haven't been eaten at Nestra, but next time I'm in London, I'm heading straight down there to, to, to enjoy the feast that I'm sure you're, you're getting through today. So um, look, it's, it's, our report is a really, really big one. It was many, many months of work very surreal actually. We were doing focus groups all through the COVID year. And so COVID was kind of strange already. You know, one was living in Zoom and, and I would just spend a lot of COVID um, um, essentially in parts of the, um, a lot of the parts of the territories occupied by, by, by Russia and, and across the country, listening to Ukrainians, talking with Ukrainians. So I don't know where I spent my COVID year. I mean, physically I was in Golders Green Mentally, I was, I, a lot of it, I was in, in Ukraine the whole time. Um, so um, why don't I get the ball rolling and, and I'll speak of the positive things that we found in our reports and then, and then, uh, uh, and then Yara can, think, can talk about the things that actually worried us a lot because it's a real mixed bag. And it was a very, very um, counterintuitive project. The things that we thought would divide Ukrainians actually can unite them. And sometimes the things that we thought would unite are actually quite divisive. So look, a couple of framing things first. So, you know, what do we mean by independence? I mean, the historians will say straight away, this isn't 30 years of independence. Independence started in, I don't know, uh, during, during you know, the, the other uh, attempts of, of creating a Ukrainian Republic. So, so we are of course talking about, you know, this latest iteration of Ukrainian independence. In any case, that's what we thought. When we began to ask people, that's not how they view things at all. Um, and it's a really important moment. A lot of people see independence as a process, yeah? And, and for them, you know, a lot of them would say, you know, I didn't really feel Ukraine was independent until the war with Russia. That's where I began to think we're becoming independent for the first time. And others would say, we're still not independent. And so I think that's already a very interesting note to bring in. This is a, this is a process, this is a, uh, a period of, of becoming and growing, but we do see certain trends in, in that process. Um, well, we did ask a lot of people, what does, what does independence mean to you as a word? And I think most people across the world would give really either sort of really bland answers or, or, or quite inane ones. And, and yeah, I hate doing this in focus groups. What do you think about a really complicated conceptual issue that no philosopher can solve? But, but still, we did wanna see what sort of associations people had with the word and and they talked, you know, they were very pragmatic. They talked about biz vis over and over and over. Even if they hadn't been abroad, it's not connected with going abroad. It's just biz vis. It's just that freedom. Whether they're talking about, you know, both talking about 1991 and, and the freedom of movement or now and the freedom of movement, it is so associated with that um, in, in Ukraine. And again, it's got nothing to do with actually going anywhere. People might never make use of it, but the first thing that comes out, biz vis. Um, you know, none of this sort of super conceptual abstract thinking about, I don't know, the nature of freedom or anything. It's biz -vis. Um, and then, And then again, very pragmatically, that shift of power from Moscow to Kiev and now often to the local level. Uh, my favorite woman, who's actually my favorite woman in the, all the focus groups, started talking about the local sausage factory. I think in Luhansk, it was the Luhansk sausage factory. And she started going, we used to send all the farsh up to Moscow and now we get to keep our farsh. So look, this is what independence means. It's control and freedom. I mean, I suppose we could excavate something very deep there about both freedom and, and control, taking back control. Sorry, I know I shouldn't use that phrase in a, in a, in a British context, but, but it is powerful. There's a reason that phrase was so powerful. Um, and then, um, uh, so, so those are kind of the main things that people talked about. And then we ask the question, what makes you proud to be Ukrainian? Um, again, this is, again, these are kind of exercises that you do at the start of focus groups to really get into the swing of things. But the answer and the universality of the answer surprises, because we thought somebody would say Shevchenko, somebody would say the other Shevchenko, you know, somebody might, you know, talk about uh, a sports or science and virtually everybody completely unprompted said something else, and that is, when we're abroad and somebody says something nice about Ukraine, 
or when we just hear something in the international media that says something nice about Ukraine. And maybe that's that's not to be an you know maybe that's 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 actually something very fundamental. Uh, we feel pride or, or or we exist to a certain extent when we're noticed by others. I I I, I know that there's some really sort of complicated German philosophy about this, but we don't need to get into that. All we need to kind of think about like how much people responded about that. Um, it was a surprise to us. It was a, a real surprise to us that you know, people talk about tiny things. When Ukraine won at a maths Olympiad in Canada or little personal things. I went abroad to Korea. This was one of our more traveled uh, participants and, and was told that, oh, Ukraine, I hear they're great at, I don't know, sports or something. Or, or just going to Slovakia and saying, oh, Ukraine, they have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they could be tiny things, tiny things, but that's what people said. That, that, that idea of being perceived by others from abroad was so, so deep and, and maybe speaks to a lot of, a lot of I don't know, may, maybe vulnerabilities as well, but very, very important. Um, and look, then we got into the meat of things because, you know, those are kind of the, those are kind of the exercises that you do to just get into the swing of a conversation. And, you know, the idea is to repeat the focus group questions over and over and over again with very different people and see what repeats. That's how you tease out the meaning. Um, but, you know, what was one of the most interesting things is that when we asked about things that we thought would you divide Ukrainians, for example, the Orange Revolution of 2004, which we know in polling does still divide people. Yeah, we can see it in the polling. People are on very different sides of those barricades still. Or the Maidan, things that we knew would be controversial. What we found actually is that those events are fairly unifying. If you approach them not through the prism of party politics, so Partia Regiona versus, uh, um, you know, you know Block Yushchenko or something, but if you actually talk about the values in those protests, everybody agrees that they were something important to fight for. So, for example, about 2004, everybody from whichever side of the political spectrum agreed that you have to fight for your voting rights. The voting rights are really important, yeah? So the minute you talked about that fight for rights uh, as, something, uh, as something that needs to be, uh, um, um, that, that is universal, people agreed. Um, and the other thing that we found was that actually, even though there is a certain, I don't know, uh, a certain cliche, a stereotype that different parts of Ukraine are, are very antagonistic in their cultural values. Actually, we found almost the complete opposite. So to give you some context, in Britain, when we do focus groups around Brexit, Remainers and Brexiteers are at each other's throats. You know, they're very antagonistic, they're very aggressive, things get shouty. Here, Ukrainians actually display this incredible ability to think about the perspective of the other side and of a very genuine tolerance. So people will go, well, you know, we understand why people are offended by XXX statue. I don't want to say which ones, but they were very understanding of the other points of view and why people might be hurt or offended and how you might social that. That didn't mean that they were sort of, they would give up on, on their idea of historical justice but they were very, very ready to listen to others. Um, it's a very, very soft, actually, uh, generally we found a very soft sort of treatment of, of cultural identity and, and, a, and, and a willingness and openness to, to discuss and to compromise, which again, maybe that's got to do with wanting to avoid, you know, something very bad, or, or maybe it's something to do with the nature of, of, of Ukrainian society. When you think about, you know, a small city like Mukachevo, Chernovtsi, or a big one like Kharkiv. I mean, these are cities that have this old, rich tradition of, of having very different ethnicities and religions and languages, and where that kind of tolerance would have been an everyday uh, tradition. And, and, and maybe that comes through today. Um, and then finally, what Ukrainians are clearly very united about, and they, we asked them, you know, what unites Ukrainians? We were pretty unsubtle in some of our, uh, in some of our in some of our questions, or when you come together, and everyone said the same thing, which is we unite in times of crisis. We're very good at that. In times of crisis and huge danger, 
we come together and we sh there's a sharing kind of resilience and adaptability. Now, those are kind of empty words that I've used, but if you think about that in the context of Ukrainian history, a territory that just in the Second World War is being invaded and, and pillaged and repressed from pretty much every army all the time, you understand what that means. There is, there is this sense of a common banding together against the big bad force coming to get you, whatever that big bad force is today. And, and that goes very, very, very deep. Um, uh, I don't think that these are just words. I think this is something that's, that's, that's really a product of Ukrainian history and more recent history like the 1990s where, where people really had to sort of group together in tiny units sometimes to survive. Anyway, I've already talked for far too long. Um, I will now let Yara do the hard work. Thank you, Peter. Um, and this idea of resilience that Peter just brought up, we're really lucky to have Orissa with us here today because she's been researching resilience for many years now and um, also thinking about what resilience means not in, a, um, in terms of something more vague, as Peter described, but as a really concrete thing in policymaking and society. So we'll come back to that later. Um, and I'll now hand over to, to Yaroslava, who's going to speak a bit more about some of the challenges um, that our research revealed. Um, so as I mentioned, Yaroslava works with us um, at ARENA, and she's been particularly central to our Ukraine-focused projects. Um, but somehow she also manages to do her PhD research at the University of Birmingham. I'm not quite sure how she <laughs> can be quite as organised as she is. Um, but somehow she, she does that and she teaches at the University of Birmingham as well um, in the School of Governance. And um, Yara's research focuses on um, looking into Russian support of the de facto states um, in the self-proclaimed republics um, in eastern Ukraine, as well as in Moldova and Georgia. So she's doing a comparative analysis um, of, of those different situations, looking at some of the commonalities that exist. Um, and Yara uh, also writes regularly on post-Soviet affairs um, for Ukrainska Pravda and Ukrainian Len. And her most recent publication, The Dark Side of Decentralization Reform in Ukraine, um, I love that title, <laughs> um, uh, appeared recently in an edited volume for Palgrave Macmillan. Um, so Yara, over to you. Thank you, Maria. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I guess I'll have to play devil's advocate and shed light on some of the dark sides of our research. So Peter already um, mentioned how our respondents praise the decentralization reform in terms of how um, through this process people felt politically and economically empowered at the local level. But however, this praise for decentralization also coexisted with a weak sense of interregional interdependence. So quite a lot of respondents were saying how they believe that each region in Ukraine is somewhat uh, autonomous, both economically, politically, and country from others. And we believe that this um, is quite dangerous for a country whose statehood is under existential threat. Um, but however, we also notice a generational gap. So this feeling of regions being autonomous was really not registered among younger uh, respondents, as well as respondents who had the possibility of traveling um, through the country and out of just searching for a better life, or also people who fled the currently occupied territories. So this showed us that the possibility, the ability to travel through the country really, really, um, um, fostered open-mindedness. Um, and what we also noticed is that this weak sense of interregional interdependence also echoed at the international level. So Peter mentioned that sometimes we were asking a bit abstract questions about how, what do you think independence means, both at the individual level and at the country level. And um, one of the most recurrent connotations was economic, financial independence. Um, and when it comes to the country level, that means that people give this very minimalistic but very negative understanding of independence in terms of freedom to do whatever you please, um, freedom from interference from others. So there was this very strong lack of a sense of interdependence with other countries. 
So when the economic connotation dominated, they were basically talking about freedom from dependence on the countries in terms of energy supplies, in terms of uh, trades, um, or even politically in terms of international agreements, because that gives a sense of a country being very isolated, and therefore it's, it's a very naive understanding of um, independence and sovereignty as being free, isolated from other countries, and that paradoxically is actually very dangerous for Ukraine as a country, as a state, because the more it is isolated politically, economically, the more its statehood is in danger. Uh, and so this weak sense of both interregional and um, inter international uh, independence really, really came to the fore in our focus groups. Um, and finally, um, I guess uh, it was some of the most precious findings in our research were through the focus groups in um, the occupied territories in Donbass, as Maria mentioned, unfortunately we didn't have the chance to uh, conduct focus groups in Crimea. Um, but nonetheless, these were incredibly rich because very often the voices in Donbass are somehow not heard. And this also emerged through our focus groups because um, a lot of respondents across the country um, held these stereotypical images about all respondents in the non-government controlled territories, NGCAs, as victims of Russian propaganda, um, who hate Ukraine, whereas these stereotypes really, really uh, were not confirmed when we spoke directly with um, people. Of course, uh, we have to be uh, we have to say caveat methodologically it's very difficult to conduct uh, focus groups there so of course um, we cannot claim that the sample was representative of the wider population but nonetheless precisely because it's so difficult to gain insight from these territories any voice that we can hear is valuable in itself um, and so through our discussions with uh, people residing in the NGCAs we found out that um, what dominates is a sense of abandonment from everyone that goes hand in hand, understandably, with a sense of profound distrust. So a sense of abandonment both from Ukraine and from Russia, for that matter. Um, and so in this respect, um, the sense of what dominates is a sense of a desire to go back to the pre-2014 times. So a desire to end the war, um, and gain some clarity in their status. They feel really isolated from everywhere and everyone. And so when we asked them about independence, another very interesting insight was that compared to responders across the country who would um, point to, 90, to the 90s as the hardest period, of course they would mention 2014 and the outbreak of the war. And what, what was interesting is also finding out that a lot of the respondents in the NGCA felt like they were never asked, both 1991 and 2014. So independence as a concept, as a process, is very often associated with a sense of failure, of instability, of tragedy. And so this is something that we have to keep in mind. Um, but however, um, we believe that there is some space for hope because um, we, when we ask about identity, very often we would assume that um, you know, there's a very fluid sense of identity, not really clear who, who do we belong with, but actually uh, when we we're asking um, interestingly questions about support, these really uh, served as proxies for um, self-identification and although sometimes when they were saying our we, it was a bit vague sometimes associated with some Russia, sometimes with the self-proclaimed republics, like locally, Donetsk sometimes with Ukraine, but most respondents nonetheless still associated themselves with Ukraine and that was a very uh, important finding for us. Um, and so moving forward, we do have to understand that the peculiar situation in which these people find themselves. So when they express a, a type of frustration, we do not have necessarily to believe that this is some sort of separatist um, aspiration. What dominates is the desire to end the current instability and to have some sort of clarity. And so we believe that this research um, 
provided um, some, some very precious insights into how people on this side of the line um, view the current situation and the process of independence more broadly. Thank you very much, Yara, and thank you, Peter, as well. Um, so we're going to come back to lots of the questions that have been raised um, by Peter and Yara um, in, in the research that we did. But before that, I'd like to turn to Orissia uh, and introduce her into the discussion. So as I mentioned, Orissia is the head of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House, and she has she's an expert on civil society um, who, who internationally recognized for her expertise on civil society and resilience. Um, and she recently published um, a report, uh, Resilience, or I've lost the title in my list, Resilient Ukraine, Safeguarding Against Russian Aggress Aggression, um, co-authored with Mathieu Boulay. Um, and it will be brilliant to hear a few more of your insights that you have from, from that report. But before that, um, oh, and I also wanted to mention that Orissia is a former trustee of the Ukrainian Institute London, um, and we're really grateful for all of the support that Orissia has um, given to the Institute. And happy to have you here tonight, Orissia. Um, but before we go on to speaking about resilience, um, I wanted to ask you um, about independence as a whole. Um, as Peter mentioned, we reflected in our research on the fact that Ukraine's independence isn't just a defined event that happened in one go, it's a process. Um, and I'd love to ask you, Orissia, now, kind of uh, with the benefit of hindsight, what some of the key achievements are that you see um, for Ukraine in the past 30 years. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. It's a pleasure to be with the Ukrainian Institute and so many of former colleagues that were also involved with Chatham House in the Ukraine Forum, and that is the program that we started inside Chatham House after the annexation of Crimea and the war in the past, to bring more spotlight on what Ukraine is and uh, why the West should care about Ukraine. So you know, it's in the sixth year of its um, operation. I actually agree that a lot in Ukraine people see independence as a process, and I remember five years ago we went to Kyiv to ask Ukraine at 25, there's a short video available on Chanhao's website what it means for you independence. And these were mostly done in Kiev. And a lot of people said, we walk up to a responsibility for the country, that it's not something that exists per se, that citizens, army, government officials, cultural leaders have to be, you know, careful about this country, have to placate, you know, there's a very beautiful Ukrainian nurture this country support it, grow it, build it, and, and, and there was a certain uh, wake-up call, of course, after the war. So I, I support that finding, I think it's, 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 a good, um, it's a good description of what independence means. I would just say three things so that we can move on. I think, first of all, the, the big achievement is that Ukraine is independent. Let's be honest, the Ukraine has a very aggressive neighbor that denies Ukraine's right for its independence, and Ukraine perseveres in that shadow of Russia. I think also um, Ukrainians, we have to be proud that the West sided with Ukraine. The whole world, I wouldn't even say the, the West, the world sided with Ukraine and backed Ukraine in the non-recognition of Crimea, despite a very, you know, you could say a strong propagandistic case that Russia was making, that Crimea was always Russian, and what's a big deal, it's a unique case, let's forget it and move on. But it's very important uh, achievement of Ukraine to have the back of the world. And the fact that um, Ukraine throughout all this time really built a force power of what I would call civil society and media. Because, you know, we have a neighbor, Russia, where, you know, we come from the same tradition, and even Belarus and even Moldova and other countries, they don't have such strong civil society as Ukraine has. And there's a certain sense of entitlement among Ukrainians that they have the right to demand to have this freedom, visa free, what not, to open business, not to, you know, to be, to be corrupt free, if possible, of course. And I think it's a great achievement, and that brings me to another achievement, which is, of course, democracy. Ukraine has avoided the temptation of totalitarianism and, and autocracy, which is fantastic news, because this is kind of a software that is within Ukraine that allows it to, to grow and develop. And, and I think 
the fact that for Ukrainians, and I don't know if this came up in your focus group, the Western democracy is still a model, despite all the disinformation and propaganda. And, and I read focus groups from three kind of borderland cities, um, near Russian border, near Hungarian border, and near um, Romanian border. And they all, when they were asked, they all want more democracy, and they all named Western countries as a model for democracy. So that's a very good news. I actually, on decentralization, I can imagine that there are risks, Yara, you're referring to. But I think it's a very, very important achievement because it gave Ukrainians an ownership again over the, the resources, over the communities. Because otherwise, if you don't have a stake, somebody comes, takes, you don't even notice. I'm sure a lot of people in Slovakia they weren't even sure well, what has changed in their life when the separate came and, you know, for that was like, okay, we didn't own in the first place anything. So now, believe me, people who invested their local taxes in, in playgrounds, in schools, in hospitals, in um, plenty of other things, hubs, uh, they will be very worried if somebody takes it back from them because they were part of, they own it. And, and finally, I would say that it's cultural revival. Marina Pesanti is sitting here, she did a paper for us. I think it's amazing what is happening in Ukrainian culture. And Ukrainian Institute is bringing some of it here because there's so much cultural product in Ukraine. You go to a bookstore, previously, five, six years ago, you wouldn't find any bestsellers that were in English translated into Ukrainian. Now, I mean, it happens with the lag of a couple of months. This never existed before uh, in Ukrainian um, in Ukrainian uh, uh, history, and, and I think this revival will, will really, really help together with decentralization and civil society to have Ukraine in the right place. Thank you, Orisia. Um, and yes, the paper that um, Orisia mentioned by Marina Pesenti, you can find out on the Chatham House uh, website. And uh, we actually had an event recently with Marina that you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, speaking about this amazing cultural revival in Ukraine. I was just in Ukraine in the summer. Every time I go back, there are just so many amazing things happening um, all around the country, not just Kiev. I was in Odessa, um, which has changed so much since the last time that I went there. The Zeleny Theater there are doing such, such amazing things. Um, so it's great to enjoy some of these positive, really, like, huge achievements for Ukraine um, uh, since independence. Um, and. We'll keep on the positive track before we start to speak about some of the challenges um, that, that there are. Um, and this is something that maybe hasn't been a positive um, topic, which is the question of history, um, which has of course been so manipulated and used to divide people in Ukraine. Um, and you know, there are still divides that exist, um, which we, we definitely saw in our project. But what we also saw is that um, is this tolerance that Peter mentioned a bit earlier, um, and actually an understanding among people that history has been manipulated. People know that that's what's going on, and actually on an individual level. So we don't have our colleague Oksana Lumishka with us today. She's, she's got a few quotes that she comes back to when she's describing our research, um, and one of them um, is, I think, a, a participant in Eastern Ukraine or Southern... From uh, Kherson. Um, uh, who was just saying, oh, let them have that bandera, it's okay, we don't, we're, we're fine with that, we, you, you, people can have their different heroes and let's just not make it into a big um, divisive thing. Um, and then the other thing that we um, saw in our research is, is a lot of the shared experiences that people have, um, this feeling of common hardships that, you know, Ukrainians have gone through so much in history and that's some, something that um, Ukrainians can draw strength from, but also um, the recent history of the 90s, which um, has been seen as a negative time, and of course it was such a turbulent, difficult time, but there can also, we did see a bit of a sense of pride from people um, about the um, adaptability and the inventiveness that people needed to have to get through this period. Um, and I'd like to hand back over to you, Peter, to elaborate a little bit on this and ask you um, how much scope you think there is for history to actually be something unifying for Ukrainian society. So look, I think, I think we have to be very careful here. Um, the job of history is not to divide or unify. The job of historians is to confront the past. And, and it's not like the history unites or divides. I mean, the history just has to be 
unearthed and faced and, and, brought, and, and, and brought into education. There is another thing though, which, which, which is what I'm interested in, not as a historian, but as a, as a, as a journalist, as a, as a writer, as a, as a TV producer in my past, I was a documentary TV producer and I still advise on a lot of um, factual TV projects in the region, which is then what choices do we make about how to discuss these historical issues in our media and our public sphere? So that's where it sort of gets interesting and that's where I think we have room for nuance. Um, look, I'm in the US at the moment where um, a lot of the US doesn't want to face up to um, a lot of the elements, there are racist elements in American history. No kid in American history really learns about reconstruction the years after the Civil War, when you know it seemed as if uh, um, you know the anti-slavery side won, but then that was undermined decade after decade after decade, especially in the South. You don't learn about that because everybody enjoys the, the myth of, of we had a civil war and we had catharsis and it finished. It didn't finish. But the question then is, how do you talk about that? Um, are there ways of introducing that, given that there will be a lot of resistance to it? Is there a ways of talking about that that makes people more open to the evidence? So Asa Fingfors, the Swedish philosopher, talks about the phenomenon of knowledge resistance. Uh, Daniel Kaha and the, the Yale sort of sociologist talks about cultural cognition, which basically says that when evidence attacks your identity, you tend to reject it. So our challenge as communicators, as storytellers, is like, okay, how do we integrate these really often divisive bits of history into the public sphere? How do we tell these stories? that they stop becoming weapons that are used to attack people with, but become what they should be, a way to reflect on the past, to bring trauma, and the definition of trauma is that which is unarticulated, into public speech, and then to move on. Yeah. And to move on with, by understanding the lessons we've learned and the common values. My sense is those common values and aspirations for the future are there. Most Ukrainians, want a future where human rights matter and which they call European. And I think that's what they mean by European. So listen, there are people in Ukraine who are Soviet nostalgists. We see that in Poland. They say the Soviet Union was full of lovely things, which, you know, for me as the child of Soviet distance in Ukraine makes me want to vomit. Fine. But I want to understand what do they mean? And when you start talking to people in focus groups, you understand that actually they recognize the Soviet Union had human rights abuses. They recognize, they don't deny they existed. They recognize the horrors of Chernobyl and the Afghan war. They recognize all of this. And it really is a case of talking about these things and then maybe not screaming at them, all the nostalgia you feel is wrong, but saying, well, do we want these things in the future? And usually the vast majority will say they don't. There is 5% of Stalinists, but our, our job is to isolate the crazy people, yeah? They'll always be crazy people. Actually, in every society, 15%. Every 15, we have 15% totalitarian mentality in every country. But the, the, the battle is for the other 80%. So it's about how we talk about history. That's the point. And again, once you dig into it, there are common values, common experiences, and very much a common vision for the future. Look, it's not easy. Um, and it's not easy when there is an enemy who is misusing history every day in a weaponized and political way. And the problem is with fighting the Kremlin's misuse of history is the Kremlin doesn't care about the facts. It's not actually about history. Yeah? This is not a debate with another historian about what specifically happened in Volin or how do we count how many people died in Volin, which historians dispute. Yeah? They're not using it that way. So the problem is when we're always reacting to what the Kremlin is doing, we're slightly playing their game. And so it's very, very hard. We have to both push back against the Kremlin's disinformation and manipulation, but also start creating our own tradition of talking about Ukrainian history and what it means for the future. Um, and, and, and is there stuff that can unite? Definitely. Is there common visions for the future? Definitely. So there's lots of positives. 
probably easier in Ukraine than in America, where I'm not sure there is a common vision for the future anymore. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, Arisia, I wonder whether you have any thoughts on this uh, from a civil society perspective, or whether there are any initiatives that you've seen that you think have achieved it well to have an open dialogue about history that is still managing to be nuanced and fight some of this um, disinformation, or just any other comments that you might have a bit, um, on, on history. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very broad question. It's a big word, word history. I think it's, you know, we often come to history to search for some answers, I think. And it is interesting to see the time in Ukraine where people are genuinely interested in history. We are, I, I think it's a positive side. And I think that um, there's a certain um, uh, understanding also of the role Ukraine played in the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is important for Ukraine's own confidence and understanding even of the origins of independence, because independence didn't fall off the sky. It was a, it was a creation and risk-taking of Ukrainian pol politicians, dissidents, diaspora, lobby in the, U uh, in the United States. So there's a very interesting documentary, I don't know if you've seen Collapse by um, Suspilna, it's available on YouTube, there are seven episodes where, you know, they're doing interviews with eyewitnesses of, of those um, moments, I really recommend you take a look at it. Um, I just want to say that there, I, I find in the Ukrainian kind of more intellectual and opinion maker society quite healthy debate about history. I think the role of pan-Ukraine plays in raising some of these very complicated issues uh, is, is um, very commendable and they are going outside of the bubble also with publishing quite, quite interesting collection of essays and book readings to discuss these different things. The recent publication I liked about the bridges of walls Walls or bridges, and they ask different uh, writers what Ukraine should do, build walls or bridges. It, it's a very interesting play on, on this idea. But I think there's also something that uh, Ukrainian historian Hrytsak has to say with his last history book uh, about Ukrainian global context, where he actually calls Ukraine to overcome its history. Because this is how Ukraine can modernize. Leave history, of course, understand your history, but until Ukraine overcomes history, Ukraine will not be able to move forward. And of course, there are all these difficulties of, um, you know, post-genocide nation, of the trauma of the 20th century. And I think this indiscriminate violence that Ukraine lives through, I get like goosebumps when, when I talk about it, but I think it's the, these horrors of indiscriminate violence. And, and I think there's a nice metaphor where for Ukraine, um, uh, direction towards Europe, towards European Union, is leaving that space of violence and coming more into a rule-based order where people would feel more security. And I think this is really what drives Ukrainian independence, deep down, Ukrainian aspiration for EU deep down. And just one short example in our paper that you mentioned, Resilient Ukraine, we looked at the project called Museis Zakreto na Remont, no, Musei Vitkreto na Remont, Museum is open for innovation, where they invited local communities in Lysychansk, all the way in the east, to write a story of Lysychansk themselves. You know, they took teachers, kids, everybody who was interested, come to the local museum, and they went exploring around. And I think this is what Ukraine needs, the self-exploration, so they don't feel like somebody you know, dispatched history from the top because there's no trust to the top. I think this rediscovery was very interesting, collecting eyewitness stories, observing architecture, and building the story step by step. That, that actually people felt quite inclusive and they felt pride for this. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think that culture is, uh, and the kind of um, projects that Marina wrote about in her paper are going to be a really important way of exploring history in, in a way that can be relevant and exciting to people. And, that, and I also hope um, that this will happen for the period of history um, just after the revolution in Ukraine, which I've, I've been fascinated by and actually is my way in why I became interested in Ukraine in the first place was um, learning about the Ukrainian theatre director Les Korbas. Um, and so few people know about this period, and if they do, unfortunately, they know about it because of the well, because of the fact that all of these artists, this 
amazing renaissance were all killed by the Soviet regime. So then it turns into a negative narrative again, without people necessarily knowing about all of the amazing culture of that time, um, which is such a shame. So there is definitely a lot that's positive to explore, and, um, and the, the museum project that you mentioned sounds fantastic. Um, so moving forward now to more of the challenges, um, maybe we'll, I want to just come back to this idea of interdependence um, that Yara mentioned for us, because it's, that was kind of something that I'd never thought about with this project uh, before we kind of dug into it more, that for strong independence, there needs to be this responsibility and a sense of interdependence. Um, and uh, another quote from our colleague Oksana uh, that she loves is um, from somebody else, Yara will know uh, who, who it was, um, who said, oh, beetroots and carrots, they grow everywhere in Ukraine. And, you know, this sense that, like, actually the different regions don't really need each other and um, we'd be better off if it was just uh, our region, you know, we, we know what we're doing here and um, that, would be, that would be better and we're not all interdependent. Um, uh, but I wonder, um, maybe Yara, we can come back to you just, um, I don't know whether there are some, well, I, I wonder about the solutions, I kind of, I wanted to turn the tables um, to, to Yara, but I, I, maybe it makes sense for you to start, because I know this is something you thought about in your resilience paper, um, what needs to happen to, what these horizontal trust, but you know, Yara wrote her paper on the dark side of decentralization and we thought a little bit about the risks that there can be, but actually that can, uh, obviously you mentioned a lot of in your paper about how that can be the, um, the starting point for trust and for civic engagement. If people can get involved on a local level, um, then that can start to build trust across the country. So maybe let's just turn the conversation now to what needs to happen practically. Um, and um, would you be happy to start with us here? Maybe we can come to you afterwards, Yara. Yeah. I mean, just because we peppered in a lot of resilience here, yeah. just, and this is also quite a, a buzzword now, a lot, a lot of people are talking about it, but we came to this in 2017 when we were looking at vulnerabilities of Ukraine. First we said, okay, we know that Russia is assaulting Ukraine. What are Ukraine's vulnerabilities? And of course, uh, you know, the media space, the political sphere, the security and conflict came as top um, vulnerabilities. And then we said, how do we turn the tables and ask ourselves what it means for Ukraine to be resilient? And resilience means that basically it's an it's a ability of an entity, a state, or even a person to withstand shocks and to be able to perform its key functions under assault. And if the person is agile and... Um, um, adaptable enough, it can actually get a resilience dividend by using a crisis and a shock to come to a different level and, you know, in a way to, to adapt to a new quality. So that's, that's what we're talking about, resilience. And, and I think Ukraine is an excellent example of a resilient nation. Um, despite all these tragedies and crises that Ukraine has been through, we preserved independence. Of course, with some losses, we lost say 7 million Ukrainians who live in the occupied territories, we lost some of the territory of Ukraine. But Ukraine still, if I would, um, I would say pers persists on its strategic choice of transatlantic integration and uh, building a Western model rule-based order. So how do we, I agree actually that we need this interconnection for, um, for resilience because um, resilience comes from this you know, feature of having horizontal teams of teams. You know, there are so many threats that are attacking communities and Russia is very smart in finding these local stories, be it environment in the, you know, in Mariupol, or uh, be it Hungarian language in uh, Uzhorod. You know, they micro-target to undermine cohesion of Ukraine. So um, it's very important that local teams call them Rayoni Oblast communities. Local teams have capabilities on their own, but that they also play together a game. 
Because otherwise, if all of them are pulling in a different direction, it's very difficult and it's easy for Russia to manipulate. So few things what I think could be done is this democratic citizenship. And I don't know how much you picked up in your survey what people mean by democracy. Um, Peter talked a little bit about it. But we need to improve political participation. I mean, it's very difficult now with political parties, I mean, who really joins them, but there are other ways that people can participate. And I think that is very, very important. And Ukraine needs to address these inequality issues because whenever you have high inequality, societies are not very resilient, you know, because there's always us versus them. Um, and, and there's more social protection issue has to come in the forefront. And this is what also Ukrainians want. I think that's an important conversation to have. I would um, really argue for more transport connectivity across Ukraine. I mean, if you look at the statistics of how many people left Slovyansk, actually, it would be like, uh, I'm talking just outside of their hometown, not abroad. I mean, it's probably 10%. So internal mobility is disaster in Ukraine. People don't travel across regions. Um, sometimes they just go to Kiev to do some, you know, bureaucracy what they need. Even now they don't need to go to get a visa to Kiev. Before everybody was going to Kiev to get a visa. Now they can just fly out of their regional airport. Um, and uh, I would say that um, Ukrainian reforms are very uneven and that comes back to the need to uh, have more uh, cross-regional exchanges, best practices, um, for people to um, for people to understand how they can come to the same level. And here it's interesting, the, the decentralization of Italy. Uh, it's a famous book by Putnam who was comparing Italian provinces, what happened with them after decentralization based on their history. And I fear that Ukraine may repeat the same uh, pattern because of the Magdeburg law that was coming all the way to Kiev, but not much further east. And this sense of civic community that exists in those more center-west um, cities that is absent in the southeast, that they will suffer. And then you will have a real governance split that is, that is, is dangerous, I think. Thank you, Orosia. Um, so, Yara, maybe we can actually take an extra step um, with my next question. Um, which is to think about the um, occupied territories in Donbass and um, how to reach out to them, uh, how to reach out to people there, um, because this is obviously something that you've been thinking about in your PhD research as well as um, as we uh, thought about it in our arena research. Um, so can you share some of your insights on that? Uh, yes, of course. Um, actually, um, some of the challenges that we've seen in GCA connect to the previous two topics that um, we discussed. One is history. So, um, basically, in my PhD, I look at the role of Russian state and non-state actors in promoting a number of state-building and nation-building processes in de facto entities like the self-proclaimed republics in Eastern Ukraine and Transnistria. And I look at different policy domains, one of which is the educational cultural domain. And your previous question was whether, you know, we look at history as a divisive issue and how can we look at history as, as, a, as a unifying force. Well, we've seen that in the occupied territories, history continues to be used as a weapon. So when you look at the local school curriculums, um, basically there's this narrative that um, all the time that Donbass has been part of the Ukrainian state, that was a period of oppression, of forceful Ukrainization. Whereas the historical evolution of Donbass has always been part of the evolution of the Russian states and the Russian nation. And this narrative is, is being promoted over and over again and goes hand in hand with processes of militarization of youth. So there's youth that is being basically co-opted in militarized movements that that basically turns them into future um, soldiers of so-called Republican armies or even parts of the Russian armed forces or local security uh, agencies. And so again, this also connects with the question of interdependence and regional interdependence because when we think about future integration, we have to take into account the processes that have been happening over the past eight years now. Um, so you mentioned history, what happens with people who for years, especially the younger generations who have no knowledge, have no memory of living 
as part of the Ukrainian state, what happens in the future context of reintegration. Um, and in terms of um, uh, re like interregional integration, uh, you mentioned the, the book chapter that um, um, I published, The Dark Side of Decentralization. I don't want to look like the bad guy. I, I really do have cold, positive, optimistic outlook, but um, in that um, article, what I was trying to do was challenge this in my opinion, overly optimistic argument that was circulating in the context of the promotion of the decentralization reform that basically was seen as this uh, invincible instrument against Russia's promotion of separatism in Ukraine. But actually what I was looking at was consistent efforts by regional elites that were a member of Medvedchuk and NGOs, Ukrainian Choice, that as we all know is a big promoter of the idea of federalized in Ukraine. And what they were doing was exploiting the vocabulary and the instruments of the decentralization reform to talk about and using populist messages to say how you need to um, use local resources and obtain this sovereignty at a very regional level. So basically they were using all of these instruments to create a parallel system of power and undermine Ukraine's constitutional order from within. So in, in connection to the arena research, this, we go back to the point of why it's so important to promote interregional, a sense of interregional independence. If this interregional um, interdependence, sense of interregional independence is weak, this is what creates potential entry points of separatist sentiment and destabilization. So, of course, thinking about challenges, as I mentioned before, we really need to be aware of processes that have been happening um, over the past years uh, when we think about potential scenarios of reintegration. Um, there are also very pragmatic considerations such as in terms of economic integration, um, you know, these regions are effectively completely integrated currently in the Russian economic space. Uh, so when we think about territories and people, we have to consider what has been happening so far. Um, and in order to do that, we also need to listen to the voices of people residing there. This is what we try to do. And if I just, because I really want to fight this bad image of the bad guy that I've created for myself on the panel, but on the point of history, um, you know, I think that I, I do agree with Peter's premise that, uh, you know, the job of historians is, is not so much to unify divide, it's to confront the past. And I believe that the problem with Ukraine is that historically the knowledge of its history has not, in, internationally, has not been done through the voices of Ukrainian historians. Ukraine has been understood through the voices of other countries' understanding of Ukraine. And so I believe that one. A uh, really optimistic outlook that we can have is this rediscovery of Ukraine um, as a country, its uh, cultural legacies, melting pots of different cultural and historical legacies that I think is a unique richness that Ukraine has. And I believe that 2014 was indeed a turning point, as Maria mentions, every time you go to Ukraine, there's this, this explosion of initiatives and, 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 and cultural sense, self awareness. And as we saw in our research with ARENA, Ukrainians are very proud when they are being recognized abroad as Ukrainians. So now that Ukrainians have rediscovered their voice, international voice, I believe that um, a very positive development of how history can be uh, an instrument of, 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 of unity is also uh, kind of telling the world those unique contributions that Ukraine uh, has given to all history. Thank you, Yara. I'm um, getting aware of time. We've already covered so much ground, and I want to make sure that um, you all have a chance to ask questions as well. Um, but before that, I'll just turn back to, to you, Peter. Um, maybe you can share any thoughts that have come up for you, um, but it would be great to take the um, framing of recommendations now, because we haven't spoken about the recommendations in our arena report, and maybe you can pull out um, some of those that you feel are the most important. Listen, I, th I think that, that, that there's an underlying story and that we're trying to tell, which is in the title of the study, um, From Independence to Interdependence. And um, 
So, so, so what do we mean by that? Uh, I think we've talked about it a little bit today with this idea of, of, of Ukrainians not feeling that they're necessarily part of one organism, but that's one state organism, you know, not one identity, one state. And, and I think that's, that's, that's really important. I, I think in many ways, if you take, um, you know, sort of a, a lot of, a, a lot of theorists like Benedict Anderson, who I just made a BBC program about last week. It's on the Radio 4 analysis slot, um, if anybody wants to listen to it. But so Anderson's idea of a nation is, is a, a sort of a, a space where people never meet. You know, a, a, a stockbroker in London never meets the dock worker in Hull. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but let's use those cliches. Um, but they feel that they're interdependent and need each other and part of a larger tapestry and part of, sort of a, a larger organism that is that is interdependent. That's weak in Ukraine. The irony is people are interdependent. You know, there actually is interdependence. They do need each other. Just nobody's surfacing that. Nobody's bringing that out. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the first mission for, for media in Ukraine to try to bring out these uh, these interconnections and interdependencies, and um, and traditionally that's been media's role. It's traditionally newspapers and, and novels, if we talk about media more generally, or films or TV shows that do this. This is what Anderson called an imagined community, not an imaginary. It's not in, it's not fake, but it has to exist in the imagination, and and somebody has to do that. Uh, that I think is a new mission for Ukrainian media. I, th I think Ukrainian media. Obviously, a lot, of, a lot of them play a schizophrenic role. They've got to serve their oligarchical masters. But I meet a lot of people in there, even in the very commercial ones or very politicized ones, who really feel that a responsibility to create a resilient Ukraine. And, and then there's this whole plethora of, of really brave and, 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 and sort of um, hardworking civic media as well. So I think that's a whole you know, that's a whole philosophy that they need to adopt. And, and what does that mean in practice? I mean, obviously that means storytelling and TV shows and talk shows that do this all the time and, and TV series that do this all the time. But I think it can be more than that. I think in today's world, uh, media is shifting from being purely uh, information resource that's sort of giving people stuff. There's a lot of information out there. You don't really need media for that to doing something else, to being something of a, a public service, or almost like social service. And, and you know, this is often described as engagement journalism or, or social journalism, where the idea is, you know, the media goes into the different communities and really tries to find out what people care about, what they need, brings them into the process of editorial decision-making. So it sort of integrates both across the country and then from the media to communities. Um, I think that those kind of, you know, engines of integration, both on the imaginative level, but also on the kind of uh, very practical local level, that needs to be the new paradigm that Ukrainian media works in. Um, we can also talk about what, what, what government needs to do. And I think Arisa said it, it's all about participation. Participation breeds trust. We know that by looking at the statistics for how people feel after they've participated in local budget making, for example, in Brazil or, or in Kiev, where there is an initiative to do this. But we need a lot more of that. Um, this government has said that it wants a government in a smartphone. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Online world gives so many opportunities to um, integrate people into the political process. Um, and there's lots of international experience about how to do that. Ukraine could really be a global leader. It has the IT potential. It has um, this desire for, for local sort of for empowerment. Um, and um, you know, all the, and it's an existential threat. It's not just a, a luxury for Ukraine, it's, it's existential. So, so all the ingredients there, um, just do it. Thank you, Peter. Um, I promise I am gonna uh, invite you all to ask your questions. I just feel the need to um, let Orisia maybe say a little bit more there, because as Peter said, we're on the same page and I was reading um, the resilience report that Orisia um, wrote and engagement is such an important thing that comes out of that. So I wonder, obviously, if you can maybe just add a couple of points. If I may, because I think you mentioned uh, about Ukrainians who live in non-government controlled territories. And, and I think it's a very difficult um, task for Ukraine. Uh, and and you, you may have noticed the launch of the Crimea platform, which adds Crimea to the discussion of the past, which I think it's an important achievement of Ukraine's diplomacy, just 
to ensure that summit took place on such high level. And from what I understand, they want to make this meeting an annual meeting so that, you know, in a way, uh, we say that Crimea is not forgotten and we have some kind of a strategy for this interim period of occupation. So that's, that's good that this second pillar is now added to Donbass. But just on Donbass, I think it's um, because this conflict is now quite um, contained, and actually, the, um, the um, it was very unusual in all conflicts of the world the number of people that were crossing the contact line. I mean, I don't remember per year; it was a million roughly people going back and forth. Now, after COVID. The, this traffic substantially um, uh, decreased, so which means the exposure to Ukraine decreased. So it, now it becomes really like court down with Russian passports, the, the citizens from there being used, abused, I would say, for Russian Duma elections. And um, it, 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 it poses a big challenge. And also what it does, you know, and I think that Ukraine has to seriously do what it can control, right? And that means uh, internally displaced people and the veterans of war. Because this is, uh, when we're talking about this interconnection and the risk groups that are, could cause outbreaks of violence uh, and, you know, and be manipulated into uh, uh, unuseful ex, uh, you know, adventures, and we've seen some examples of that, um, could undermine social cohesion. I haven't used that word, but I think it's a good one when we're talking about the tapestry that um, Peter mentioned, is how do you have all these threats connecting together without these ruptures? And I think focusing on you know, assistance to families that are uh, victims of war, children, mental assistance, PSTD assistance, uh, domestic violence, there's a plethora of issues, and I know we hosted this last week, the Vice Prime Minister Resnikov, who mentioned that they are working on a uh, new strategy for reintegration of ITPs, and that they are seriously considering how to attract more investors and creating this belt of prosperity along the contact line, which sounds very difficult. How do you convince investors to go uh, you know, in the high-risk area? But if you think of some kind of insurance, preferential tax, maybe this could be internal investors, not necessarily foreign investors, but they should do as much as they can on the territory that Ukraine controls. Thank you, Orisia. Okay, so who has questions? Maybe we'll collect um, two or three now. Um, I don't think this microphone is going to extend far enough. It depends. Um, it would be wonderful for people on the balcony to ask you. So if you project your voices for your questions, if we can't reach the microphone to you, and if Peter can't hear by Zoom, then I can, I can repeat. Um, so please raise your hands with your questions. Katerina, you are close enough for the microphone, so why don't you start? Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, um, my question was, um, I'm from Dnipro and um, I studied in Kiev in, in um, uh, Kiev Mohil Academy and uh, I had this kind of, um, you know, notion always that people from the West, especially from Lviv to be <laughs> precise, they have this slightly condescending attitude towards people in the East of Ukraine when it comes to, you know, independence or, um, you know, history even. And it's, uh, it always felt like, you know, this uh, parable from Bible where there is this lost uh, younger brother and, and uh, when he comes back, the older brother believes that he, he needs to repent before he can be, you know, uh, to accept it, yes. And so, even still here with our friends in, in London, uh, you know, we, we, we have these debates about how we should treat history and it's almost like they feel that they have bigger claim on independence and, you know, we in, in Eastern Ukraine should indeed repent and then, you know, go through certain procedure, you know, to kind of think about our history, what we did, and then we can be, you know, part of, of bigger Ukraine. Whereas, for me, I was always like, guys, let's, let's focus on similarities and let's, you know, create something bigger. So maybe it's very subjective, but how do you feel from your research? Is like, is it something like that in your, um, you know, in what you saw, or, or am I completely, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and let's take another question. Um, anybody on the balcony have a question? No? 
Oh, hi, Steve. I'm not going to try and pass the mic, but... I'll, 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 I won't jump down. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter mentioned, I think it was Peter, mentioned the trans... No, it was Alessia, mm -hmm. um, who mentioned the, you know, uh, need to have a, a transatlantic, not union, but, but an aspiration to be part of that. With America um, apparently turning away from Europe and focusing on the Pacific, um, is, is there anything now as a solid to sort of yearn and, and to unite with? Thank you, um, Steve. And maybe that's one more question. Hello, thank you so much for an interesting presentation and optimistic and worrying results. <laughs> um, my question is about, um, uh, Peter mentioned um, what unites Ukrainians from your research that, uh, and other speakers also said about this, that uh, um, Ukrainians are united uh, in times of crisis uh, to survive. Um, now we have in Ukraine uh, a going pandemic, COVID-19, but uh, we can see that uh, the majority of population are not going to get vaccine, they uh, report in the national stories. A week ago I was in Ukraine and I traveled from Kiev to Kharkiv, my uh, home city, and uh, I saw no people wearing masks at all on the train. So how can you explain this phenomena? Uh, now, is it not crisis? We are going from one crisis to another and people just fed up with this? Is it fatalism? <laughs> is it a mistrust to the government or among uh, each other? Like, can you, maybe it's not directly to your research, but uh, can you <laughs> comment this? Thank you. Thank you. Um... Actually, uh, so we'll, we'll go straight into the discussion, but just on COVID quickly. As Peter mentioned earlier, we were doing these focus groups during COVID when it was so much in all of our minds. And one of the things that really struck me during that project was that we were asking all of these questions and at the beginning of focus groups, there's always some questions just about a general life. And, um, and it was amazing to me the extent to which COVID wasn't on people's <laughs> radars. Because to me, we were in lockdown, everyone was thinking about COVID. And Ukrainians were just, it was like, ah, oh, COVID is just like one tiny thing. Like, we've gone through a lot more than that. Like, uh, <laughs> calling us from cafes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were like, oh my God, masks on going outside. Oksana was in a cafe, like, hey guys. Uh, um, okay, so we've got a question about um, aspiring towards the US and transatlantic partnership and. Um, what Ukraine can hope for in terms of partnership with the US. Um, Katerina's question about um, this feeling that maybe people in Western Ukraine feel that their Eastern um, compatriots need to repent and a bit of a patronizing idea, whether we see that in our research. And finally, uh, a bit about where COVID fits into this uh, common hardships um, uh, for Ukrainians. Who would like to start with one of those um, I'm happy perhaps to start with the question on West versus East, because um, to be fair, this is one of the frameworks that uh, we just cannot escape, like West versus East, even though this was one of our premises in the research, we wanted to fight to counter the stereotypical classification of Ukraine, we ended up having to kind of um, recruit from Western Ukraine, from Eastern Ukraine, Central and South. But um, I'd say that one um, interesting quote, we, we've been mentioning a lot of quotes from our focus groups, but there was one um, woman from Western Ukraine who, in reflecting on the decommunization laws, would say that she believes that um, it was done wrongly, in the sense that it was done in a very hasty and top-down way. So what was missing from that process was a more bottom-up discussions about how people feel about a certain sort of themes. So that was a reflection of how not all Westerners are radical banderasi who uh, have a very patronistic uh, look on people, say, in the Central and the East. When we look at recent history, um, also very interesting um, 
uh, kind of memory was shared by a woman, an elderly woman from a southern city who was talking how in the early 90s she was uh, and, and other wives were um, basically blocking um, an air, like the, the, you know, the lane through which airplanes go, military airplanes go, in order to fight for the rights of their husbands to um, get a salary you know, in the middle of the 90s was economic um, poverty. So it was an expression of, of common sense of fighting for rights and she described this memory as the little contribution to the process of Ukraine acquiring independence and a sense of entitlement to fight for the rights. So what I'm saying is that very often we talk about these very broad and complex processes from a top-down perspective and we do not include in these reflections the actual personal memories. And so in, in another ARENA project about memory wars, uh, one of the most interesting findings was that uh, people tend to um, understand, people tend to approach very controversial um, aspects of the past in a more tempered way when these controversial pages are narrated through personal memories of people who've actually experienced certain periods themselves. So I believe that um, you know, when we talked about independence, it's just that we need to talk to each other a bit more and try to distance ourselves from these very top-down, a bit elitist conversations about, you know, who made more of a contribution to Ukraine, Ukraine's history. Uh, it's wrong to apply frameworks from other historical and political contexts to Ukraine, you know, where it takes to uh, come up with these, with social cohesion and a consistent nation state. Ukraine history is tragic, it's been torn apart from different sides. But, you know, the, the myth of the Cossacks of the nation, it's not really a live story, is it? So, what I'm saying is that um, it's just important to re discover all of these different fragments that we believe make Ukrainian history rather than reiterating these divisions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can, I, can I just remark? Yeah, sure. Just to add, because uh, I think that Katarina's question is very uh, interesting. And this um, is circulating around Ukraine so often. And what if... Um, that this is something like a part of cognitive warfare, of Russian cognitive warfare, because, um, I don't know, Katrina, for example, um, many Ukrainians from central part, from, from, uh, so from different parts, of, uh, afraid to go uh, <laughs> to Lviv, and they suppose that uh, if you don't speak fluently in Ukrainian, so mm -hmm. that something happens. But, in real, in life, so uh, when they come there and nothing happens, mm -hmm. and people so uh, <laughs> open, and so I think that we can we can look at this uh, like a part of cognitive soft power, Russian soft power, and uh, they tried to do this one after the uh, Soviet Union crashed, and uh, they're trying to circulate this and to divide actually Ukraine and from time to time we can we could <laughs> see some people who is just coming and asking Ukrainian oh wow you're divided but uh, Ukrainian tried to explain that uh, <laughs> so we're different but we have the common values and the issue even not I, I can't say this one <laughs> but um, uh, the issue in common values and not just in languages and everything and I think that this is so um, so uh, magic, I don't know, so Ukrainians <laughs> so different and we were united mm -hmm. and I think that this, because I, I hear so often uh, they sound and uh, I live in different parts of Ukraine and I live in, in Europe and I'm a combination and um, I think that we should be careful, Ukrainians should be careful with, with, with this one and this is something like cognitive warfare and it should be should be done some steps against this, this is one of the <laughs> 
So it should be done some steps. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, Peter, how much of that were you able to hear? Probably not much at all. Uh, cognitive warfare, cognitive warfare, cognitive warfare. <laughs> well, I mean, that was at the core of it. Oh, the, I mean, it's wonderful to, I mean, so Yara mentioned earlier that we did one focus group with people who have moved across Ukraine, who used to live in a different city and now live um, somewhere else in Ukraine. And it was amazing how much this group stood out compared to the other groups, how much more open-minded they were. People spoke about the idea that, um, you, that oh, I, oh, oh, unless it's reminding me, I don't know how much time. Okay, I will stop rambling. Um, but I suppose what Catalina is saying is that it's not just an idea or something you've actually experienced yourself, so, yeah. yeah my, my best friend here in London, he's from Lviv, and we, we know each other for 11 years. We studied in Kiev. So it's very, and in a very, very deep conversations, you know, sometimes at night, we come to that kind of slightly angry. So this, yeah. is the, this is the success of the cognitive warfare, actually <laughs> feeding into <laughs> real life. Yeah, okay. Um, Maybe let's move on to uh, one of the other questions about uh, the partnership with the US and also COVID. Uh, I was wondering if the focus groups were mixed or they were just regional? People were coming from the same region. Um, they, were, they were mainly mixed. Uh, so mixed. Like for example, if it was, um, um, you know, a focus group from West, different Western cities, um, the movers, the, the focus group of people who have moved around, that would be, for example, someone originally from, uh, from Luhansk who had relocated to Viv. And actually, to your comment, um, it just reminded me of this, um, um, I, he was an IDP, I believe, uh, basically was saying that he had called relatives living in, in Viv asking, is it true that you shoot people who speak Russian? And, and they're like, of course not. And once they've relocated, they confirm this is absolutely like live. Um, so yeah, that definitely makes it. Well, we did some that were split. With, uh, and by the way, the link to the report um, is in the event description that you will all have today so that you can have a look. But we, when we did 20 groups and we did some that were focused on Western Ukraine, some in the South, some that were mixed. Um, yes. I, I was just saying, I'm from view myself, so nobody's perfect. But, but I think that, I think that these kind of conversation happen when you have people meeting, you know, you know, outside of your group, if you want. And then, but I think, you know, you should be super proud because you, one of the biggest, I want to add it to my list in terms of cultural revival, also history. Siri Plokhin comes from Dnipro. He contributes so much to understanding of Ukrainian history worldwide, but also, you know, inside Ukraine because his books are translated. But, you know, I think it's very easy to be, you know, from Piemont, where we consider ourselves Piemont. This heroic narrative, it's very present. I mean, not everywhere, but I, I guess because of that UPA resistance to the Soviet regime, people feel that they've contributed. So, you know, there are certain bases to this, but interestingly enough, um, something that few people know that Ukrainian book, like, Ukrainian language book publishing in, in the Lviv was financed by Hromada from Kiev. So all the money were coming from the big Ukraine, so called. So I think there's massive, uh, you know, layers of information that we need to uncover and to, under to understand Ukraine. And I think the whole tradition of Hromada that is now decentralization, Romada, that comes not from western part of Ukraine, but from Dragomano, from Kiev, and, and from other things. But it's fascinating, and I, I think it's, uh, it's great that you picked up this topic. Just briefly on US, and maybe Peter will have to add something being based in US, but you know, I think uh, it's not easy, it's not a, a straightforward path where Ukraine is carried, you know, in the saucer to, towards its Euro-Atlantic future. Um, I think there was a revolution in Ukraine to understand where Ukraine belongs, but in the West, frankly speaking, there was not that revolution where Ukraine belongs. And this is why we have these half measures, we cannot make any pledge commitment on EU membership, on NATO membership. I think we still have, all of us, including Ukrainian Institute, Chatham House, work on that revolution in the West where Ukraine belongs. There are some opportunities, with, especially with NATO, there is enhanced opportunity partnership that Ukraine has, which is a new level of engagement with NATO that didn't exist until last year. It means Ukraine's interoperability of troops, 
it means standards. It basically means the more officers who will be able to speak English in case of crisis, they can call a rapid, you know, race group of their partners in NATO headquarters, and that is very important. But um, uh, I mean, I think on, on COVID, just one comment. Uh, when you saw how Ukrainian civil society was mobilized around COVID, you see how, this, regardless of the nature of the crisis, you have this capacity, exactly, this ability, when communities and health is at risk, when the government was still trying to understand what's going on, private sector and uh, civil society that was doing completely different work. You know, some people were working on election monitoring, some people were doing uh, community you know, consultations. They all came together around COVID. And I think uh, there is a certain level of denial because of this information, like you say, and vaccine and others. In each country, I mean, look at anti-vax movement in France and other places, but I think um, we are blessed to have such strong activism because we don't trust the state. That's a, you know, that's a curse and a blessing. Thank you, Arisia. And Peter, would you like to add? Um, look, the question about, I think it relates to what Arisia said. I mean, look, um, there's something much bigger going on. I, I get messages all the time from friends in Minsk in Burma for many years from, from Aleppo um, saying, can't you see what's going on? Can't you see what's being done to us? Why can't we hold people's attention? Let alone why is no action happening? And, and countries are like this as well. Ukraine is a whole country that is, is being victimized and bullied. And, and it's as if for Ukrainians, it's clear what's going on. You know, this is part of an old battle between democracy and dictatorship. Often Ukrainians tell me that they're fighting for the idea of Europe and the West, apart from Ukrainian democracy as well. But that, that larger story has completely disappeared in the West. So, so it's as if we're kind of like trying to plug into an electric circuit of meaning that's meant to light up this huge neon sign saying democracy and freedom that make sense from rank, you know, from, from Burma to, 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 from Myanmar, sorry, terrible, from Myanmar to, to Los Angeles. And, and, and it doesn't happen. You know, that, that, that's, that, that circuit of meanings has, has disappeared. Um, in, in, in America, I mean, it's, it's very striking. The new administration sort of says the right words that it won't seize the world as a battle between authoritarianism and, and democracy. Uh, and, and then it just gets confused as to what that means. Uh, carries off in, Ch in China, doing a deal with China to save the climate. Blinken thinks it means just doing some alliances with existing allies, which means Germany, which means betraying Ukraine. Um, Jake Sullivan wants to do neo-realist moving about ships in the Taiwan Strait. So you have, that's the National Security Council. So everyone's doing different things. Um, nobody has a common story about what democracy versus authoritarianism is. And, and so was the Ukrainian delegation were recently in DC and I was speaking to some journalists around it and they were all asking, well, how do we get attention here? How do we get, you know, uh, America to care? And, and it's exactly the same thing that I hear from, from, from people in, in all these countries that are being victimized by their own dictators or other dictators. And, and I think a clue lies in, in the Nobel Prize that was handed out yesterday to one of my heroes and, and, and friends, Maria Ressa, a Filipino journalist, who um, um, is the victim of, of a, you know, the, the leader of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, who has victimized her with online campaigns and now has kind of like opened up all these ridiculous cases against her and her media. And, and there is nothing more esoteric and really kind of not in the center of anybody's consciences than um, media in the Philippines. Like actually journalists in the Philippines get killed all the time. No one ever cared. Maria's genius was to find what was her, in her story that mattered everywhere else. She didn't go on too much about Duterte. Nobody cares about Duterte in, in, in DC, let alone in, 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 in Brussels or London or anywhere, and let alone in the general public. She said, no, no, this is about Facebook. This is about 
this new media environment that you're all a victim of. You know, the fact that you get hassled online by the school bully, the fact that your president might attack minorities online. This is all part of one thing. It's not just Duterte I'm fighting, it's the social media companies. And she transformed a completely esoteric story into something that won, what won her cause a Nobel Prize and, and that makes sense everywhere. Ukraine has to do that. Appealing to a narrative that's gone, and it, I, I'm very sad it's gone, but it's gone. Nobody in DC wants America to be the leader of democracy versus dictatorship. Um, I've heard at every session that I've been to that not only is Ukraine a local European issue, Russia is a local European issue. We do not care. We'll do the minimum to support our allies. Of course we will. We're not going to give up on Lithuania. If Ukrainians ask us for some help, of course we'll give it. We're not evil. We're not going to go and do nasty things, but it's not what we care about when we get up in the morning. That's a real crisis. So you almost have to go back to, okay, if you want others to care, what is it that connects our cause with their cause? What is that thing? And it could be many things. It could be many, many things. Of course, for a lot, it will be Russia. You know, there are obvious allies who do care about Russia. For others, it will be very, very different things. Um, we're really back to kind of square one with telling the story of democracy and explaining why democracy matters and why Ukraine's fight for democracy should matter somewhere else. Um, that's incredibly hard. Um, and I don't have any easy answers, but there are some positive examples in the world. Sorry to be depressing, by the way. Ah, okay, we need to uh, speak about something more positive <laughs> next, but... Uh, yeah, Borsch, we have Borsch to save us, thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more question? A very quick one. A very quick one, okay, that's an idiot. Please introduce yourselves, I've been... Uh, well, the, well, we might have to have very quick two questions, but they have to be quick. Okay, okay. thank you. We're allowed two questions. I'll do my best to make it quick. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Oksana. I'm a um, Ukrainian who just completed my master's, Gender, Peace and Security at the LSC. And um, the question won't be easy, I'm sorry. It will kind of follow what uh, Peter was just saying. There are some of the things that I was hoping to hear in your presentation of the research that I was missing. And um, to me, they make some of the things such, such as, for example, the discussions about the language, uh, which fit into our previous conversation about East-West Center, etc. To me, they also fit into a conversation between people's perceptions of Ukraine and the national perception of Ukraine by the state or by the opinion leaders, intellectuals. So part of my question is whether you have gauged in your focus groups the opinions of those groups as well and reflection on the discourse. And another thing that you mentioned, among others, that I was kind of lacking, I was hoping to hear, you talked about use of history um, for divisiveness, militarization of the youth, but you mentioned that in the context of territories that now are outside of Ukraine's control, similar things are happening in Ukraine on the controlled territories. And I'm sure you know that, you know, things like the rise of nationalist movements, uh, the patriotic education, um, attacks on LGBT and feminist uh, groups and I wonder whether we, uh, when we present such reports and such analysis, are willing to consider and reflect on these things as well as issues that are not only based somewhere else out there but something that we also have to deal with. And my final and last thing, it connects to my previous point. Um, I see three women presenting the report, one gentleman as well. I didn't hear anything about gender aspects of these issues. I'm wondering whether you integrated them, it was just no time to discuss them, or it was, as it often is, another blind spot in the research. Thank you so much. Sorry for my voice. I'm really moved <laughs> to be speaking about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Marco, great. Uh, I think. My name is Walter Popilok, um, second generation parents came here after the war. I'm probably more, probably more positive, I think, more than anything else. I think we have to look at where we're starting from. We're starting from a nation that's been independent in its whole history for 32, 33 years. And where we are now is a lot better and a lot bigger than we ever thought we would be. And I think we need to remain positive. I always look back to what the early 1920s were, where there was a policy of recriminalization. 
and that was cut off in the bud at its probably most positive aspect in history. And I think slowly, surely, but surely, if we go back, if we say in 30 years time have the same report, I think it will be a lot more positive and I think we will be a lot more joyous as well. Thank you. Um, so the first question, um, I'd actually like to go to um, Yara, if you're ready for that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, definitely. Um, you know, the, the issue of language came up on and on, but that goes back to the point about tolerance, that can you think of a country in which you have people in one room that speak Ukrainian and Russian and then make an English joke and then understand each other? doesn't happen. Like when we think about example of Canada, Switzerland, you look at the map, that's sort of a linguistic ghettos. Ukraine is a unique melting pot of languages and cultural legacies that, um, you know, I can't speak for all countries in the world, but it's quite unique and I think we have to capitalize on it. And when we, we had the moderator and focus groups, um, and you could see that people shifted very often easily from Ukrainian and Russian and it really never came up as a divisive issue. Uh, and so this is, I think, is something that we need to promote more and more, this understanding of, of Ukrainians' mutual tolerance about their linguistic everyday practices. Um, in terms of uh, other issues, the gender issues, um, I think that Ukraine has a double challenge because in the West, we now care about these things because there is no threat existential threat to their statehood. So now these are sort of politics of identity started becoming center of attention once. I don't want to say more fundamental issues, but the context, the framework in which we can start thinking about these issues as well has been settled in Ukraine. The issue of independent statehood, sovereignty has not been settled yet. So there are movements that do urge the need to address also these issues. It's just that all of these challenges in Ukraine are happening at the same time. Thank you, Yara. Peter, would you like to add anything on that? Um, well, I mean, keep, look, focus groups are weird environments, okay? So I don't, I, you know, we, 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 there's like any piece of research we do comes with a million caveats. Um, but there really does seem to be a difference between the sort of the anger and the passion around the language debate in, in the public sphere, as in the media sphere, I mean, and, and what we see in, in focus groups, where I can't remember whether you've mentioned it already, but like, you know, the, you know we were asked about various TV shows, what language should they be? And even Russian speakers were like, well, no, they should be in Ukrainian, we think, you know, it's, it's a history TV show, it should be in Ukrainian. And, and, and Ukrainian speakers would say, yeah, we should have Russian subtitles so everyone understands. So, like, people are just so ready to just get on with their lives um, and, and, and kind of make compromises and, and be quite open. So, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, it's a bilingual country. People slip in and out of languages. Um, and and that's, a, that's a great win. Um, the only thing I'll say, look, I, I'm all for Ukrainian being the national language and being taught in schools and, and, and Ukrainian content being boosted. I mean, we have lots of international examples like the French TV market, which also where the language is kept going. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a believer in, in, in the state helping culture as somebody who works in culture. But, um, um, but I would say one thing. You know when Putin gets really, really pissed off? when Ukrainian TV programs switch between languages and he realizes, because he watches a lot of Ukrainian TV, I know this, but, uh, but <laughs> that's what. when Ukrainian, in Ukrainian TV, they start switching languages and they understand that everybody understands what the Russians do. <laughs> All these claims, they're like us, they're little Russians, are bullshit. Russia is an empire-driven, monolinguistic, aggressive culture that excludes the opposite from itself. Ukrainianness is whatever you decide for your state policy is open and non-aggressive and tolerant and able to understand the other. And the way TV shows move between different languages is so a beautiful to listen to, but also is such an exclusive selling point 
um, that, that makes it clear that Ukrainian culture at a very deep level is very different to Russian. If it's the, another attempt to, Im, to impose another absolute meaning, another authoritarian meaning, then, then it becomes actually an imitation of Russia instead, or a mini Russia. Sadly, we see that happening in a lot of former Soviet colonies. They end up reproducing Russian imperialism in a mini mentality. I don't think Ukraine is anything like that. I don't think I see no, none of this imperial arrogance and authoritarianism in Ukraine. There seems to be zero authoritarian instincts in Ukraine. Our polling shows over and over and over how little that there is. Um, so, so, so I think I think um, I think that's kind of um, um, the way the way forward. Um, you know, kind of embracing that um, and understanding some of that some of that richness. Um, and, and kind of that's what makes Ukraine so culturally fun, so linguistically fun. So I hope that fun can remain, um, even though you know I very much think you do need a state language and a, an education in the state language, and an elite that can speak that language well would be very, very nice. Uh, I think Boris Sevsonsky's legendary line, in Ukraine we've ended up speaking lots of languages badly, is something that probably needs to be overcome. Um, so I get all that, and, and of course that's, that's a tradition that does flow without a doubt from this battle for the Ukrainian language and can survive as a language through its poets, through its writers. And, and you know, that's a very important tradition to, to our world. But I also have an uh, interesting idea. That was a long answer trying to make everyone happy. <laughs> did I do it? Did I manage to make everyone happy? <laughs> no, just an idea for Ukrainian Institute because there is a Hungarian community that is really struggling to learn Ukrainian as a foreign language. You are teaching it in London, you should go to the Ministry of Education and share your experiences. Because this is one thing that they don't have a methodology. How to teach Ukrainian as a foreign language. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Arisa. Yeah, very, very short, but to the point of language, and we mentioned that 2014 was a turning point, but when a lot of our respondents were remembering their identity in Soviet times, and a lot of them were remembering sadly how in Soviet times they were treated as second-class citizens because they were speaking Ukrainian. Even my mom would tell me that in a Russian-speaking school she would be beaten under the table because she was speaking Ukrainian. But, and so in those times, Ukrainian was considered like the language of peasants. So I still have friends of my age who, you know, before 2014 would go on a bus and there, there would be someone pointing at them, why do you speak the language of peasants? But since 2014, this has shifted and now Ukraine, a lot, I have Russian speaking friends who told me that they deliberately chose to start speaking Ukrainian and that was a political choice. So I think that these are all indicators that we're moving in the right direction of this inclusivity. Thank you, Yara. Okay, and there's very more I want to add as well, but I won't because we need to finish um, and um, enjoy some food. Pisa, we're so sad you can't join us for some Baraniki here. Um, but thank you so much for joining us via Zoom. We look forward to the next time you're in London. Um, I'm sure your Baraniki are better than the ones at Vessel Karol. <laughs> I have no uh, doubt. We must have a Baraniki showdown at some point. <laughs> Um, Orisia, thank you so much, Yara. It's been a fantastic discussion. 